Welcome back to episode 7 of the World Conquest Speedrun, where we're going to conquer all of Calradia as Frederick the Great. In the previous episode, we attempted to take Amatati several times, but failed due to enemies dogpiling us each time. We successfully defended our castle several times, and eventually snuck back to Amatati's to take an auto-resolve victory, earning us our second town. We will pick up where we left off, right before declaring war on the Southern Empire. So we bought out all the food from Poros in order to help reduce the garrison through starvation. We open up the siege by queuing one trebuchet and three Lista. In previous sieges, we had done something similar and it didn't work out, but we're hoping that they don't have the siege workshop upgrade in this town. I'm going to pause here for just a moment to point something out. If we have captured nobles, we would get messages to release them from prison for a ransom. Since we are still trying to gain relations at this point, we want to release all the nobles we can. Being on autopilot, I opened the request without reading it and instantly smashed the accept button, not realizing it was an offer for peace. Whoops. I spend about 10 seconds confused as to what just happened. Don't mind me, I'm being an idiot. We could immediately go back to war with them, but I decided to check to see what size armies were in the area to come after us and we came across this 500 troop army. They seem to be at war with the Western Empire, so we wait for them to start their siege and lose troops, allowing us to swoop in after for a cleanup action. While waiting, we spot 120 troops of reinforcements, so we quickly declare war and try to section them off separately for an easy win. Unfortunately, they're too close to the siege force, allowing them to combine their troops. We're actually behind on the balance of power here now, but we still should be okay. Pharaoh is the clan leader, and he isn't in an army just yet, so we try our luck with an attempt to recruit. This could be our best chance to avoid a large battle. Things start off on the right foot. 100% success chance for a double pass chat check. Next one is 51%, so not bad odds, but we do fail this one. Then a single chat for 80% and to finish off with another easy 80%. We now have the chance to recruit our first noble into our kingdom. He's the current owner of Poros, so it won't come cheap. As we can see, he wants just over 1 million dinars. We have been stockpiling cash for several years now, so we can handle the bill and welcome Faerun and family into our kingdom. One of his clan members immediately pop out of the enemy army, allowing us to call them into our our army along with Pharaoh himself. Our original plan to wait for the enemy to lose troops via siege assault goes out the window when Pharaoh and crew immediately enter into combat with the enemy. We don't have much choice here and join them. The enemy is heavily outnumbered so we shouldn't have an issue defeating them while minimizing casualties. The enemy looks to be a little lazy here and sit at the base of the hill instead of climbing to the top. Move! Horse forward! Forward! Our infantry and archers approach, causing them to turtle up into a shield circle formation. This makes easy work for our archers who begin to pelt them. Our infantry move into square formation as we expect the enemy cavalry to charge very soon. In order to end the battle sooner, we target the enemy nobles, which will damage his troops' morale significantly. They realize circle formation is not a winning strategy and order a full assault on our position. Our square formation should be able to take out their cavalry with minimal losses, so we move both groups of our cavalry into position to flank. We send the melee cavalry into the enemy archers and allow the horse archers to sit back and fire accurately. Once the main enemy assault has broken, we pull back all cavalry in order to avoid pointless casualties and allow our infantry square and archers to deal with further attacks. If we let our cavalry roam, they will continue to do damage, but will also take significant damage, and we can achieve the same damage using our archers without risking our expensive cavalry in the process. Again, the biggest thing to keep in mind here is to not overextend after you win the first phase of a battle. We stay grouped up and move as one cohesive army.
The wave of reinforcements start to reach our shield square and start to do some heavy damage. In hindsight, moving our infantry into line formation and charging, or moving our archers further to flank, would have been a better move here. We try to thin the herd with Satan's Tooth, but it's difficult because we must keep moving to avoid being hit. We take a massive hit from the Nablion and get a lucky last second block to avoid being decapitated. We take another hit and decide to fall back. The battle is mostly over, so we order a full-scale assault on all fronts and overwhelm the remaining enemies. We defeated 450 troops and lost just over 100 in the process, which isn't a bad way to open the war. Our original plans to take Poros are no longer valid since we recruited the owner of that town, so we must plan for our next conquest. We reached level 250 charm, arguably the best perk in the skill tree. Parade is the choice and it's not even close. We get a plus 5 bonus to the loyalty of the settlement each day we wait inside. We will be able to reach 100 loyalty very quickly with this perk combined with all of the policies we enacted. This will speed up stabilizing our town significantly. For the next target, we pick out the closest castle to our other settlements. We do this for a couple reasons, but I don't want to spoil anything here, so we will leave it at that for now. The castle is very well defended because the noble party is inside. We could back out and allow them to exit, then reinitiate the siege, but I think we are in decent shape as is now, so we continue. They have four onagers in the walls, so we start with two trebuchet and two onagers. An enemy army starts to form in the edge of the siege camp, but we have over 800 troops, so they will need more to compete with us. All four siege engines are ready, so we redeploy them and hope for the best. It seems to be doing the trick, and we clear the walls of siege engines after only a few volleys. The enemy army swells to the number of the beast, 666, so we tread lightly. One more party shows up, and they reach their tipping point, so now we must decide if we want to fight an open battle or take the siege. We have a ram prepared and four siege engines. The enemy has no siege engines at this point, and nearly half of our troop count, so we decide to assault the castle, and hope for a good defense afterwards. We open with a salvo of onager boulders. It's a thing of beauty. Because we have done some damage to the walls before the siege, some of the defensive structures have been torn down, allowing for easier shots on the enemy archers. The plan here is to allow the ram to knock the gates down and allow easier access to the inside. Ladders are less than ideal at the moment. Enemy archers tend to target the nearest enemy, so as long as troops are in front of us, we can proceed without worrying about cover as much. Our infantry are having a difficult time scaling the walls, but our archers are picking off some defenders at least. We use the last of our arrows and decide to help assault the main gate.
Without realizing it, I ran into the enemy without my weapon drawn. This is one of the risks we take when we don't use the unit identifiers as I thought those were our troops, but I really like the way the battles look without them, so we will deal with it in stride. We take heavy casualties trying to scale the walls. For some reason, our troops refuse to go through the gates and only like using one of the two ladders. This perfectly demonstrates why taking the walls down pre-battle is so important. Nonetheless, we take the castle and prepare for the keep battle. We lose 178 in the first phase, which is mostly due to my missteps. We lose another 28 troops taking the keep, but we are now in possession of the castle. Looking at Satisheim Castle, we can see that there is a lot of work to do. The only positives here are the tier 3 militia grounds and the siege workshop, so we will have to spend some time and money getting this place upgraded. If you look at the castle stats, we see a plus 9 per day from loyalty and plus 8 for security. We only need to stay here for 4 or 5 days before we're maxing out and getting the highest construction bonus from loyalty. Food is already in great shape, so it's a difficult choice between adding more food for prosperity gain or upgrading the walls for better defense. Castles are notorious for not producing dinars, so we stick to the gardens first, allowing us to increase prosperity quicker. The vote for final ownership of Sedestime Castle is here, and we decide to keep it for ourselves. We could allow Pharaoh to have it, but the AI generally does a poor job defending their own fiefs, so we will build it up for now and either give it to them later or promote a companion and donate it at some point. For the 125 athletics perk we get to decide between healing and XP while traveling or waiting in town. We go with good day to rest because we will be waiting in fiefs after taking them for a few days to stabilize most of the time. We still have over 100 wounded troops which will help bolster our defenses as they heal up. Not long after the enemy decides to break off the siege and walk away. We decide to let our army disband so they can fill up on troops. We will call them back in soon so we can attack the next fief. The previous army decides they want to attack the castle once more. Fortunately we have Ballista being sent up if they do decide to follow through this time. Now the enemy is pouring it on. Poros is under siege and one of its attached villages is being raided. The enemy decides the time is right and starts their assault. We head up to one of the ballistas to man it personally. We should have plenty of opportunities to put it to good use. Enemy archers take up position to the front, but they are not grouped up tightly, so hitting multiple troops with a single bolt will be difficult here. We make the adjustment and aim further back to the incoming shield wall. They wait for their ram and siege towers to get closer before starting their assault, giving us tons of easy shots. Looking at the balance of power, they are getting torn to shreds. At this point, we've already racked up 68 casualties inflicted with our main character. I don't think they can take much more of this. As long as the enemy continues to loiter on our left flank and we can hit multiple targets with one shot, we will stay and continue. They are starting to thin out, so we switch to bow in order to keep the casualty rate high, since we can shoot single targets faster with our bow than with a ballista.
They call for a general retreat, and we have successfully defended the castle once again. Our casualties were minimal, 53 lost and only 34 coming from our own party, and defeating an army of over 500. We end up with 108 casualties personally inflicted. Not bad. After the battle, we call our clan parties back into an army so we can mount a defense of Poros. We can only muster 400 troops, but the enemy sieging the town is over 1,100. This won't be an easy situation to deal with, but we still have a few options. We can wait for them to assault and lose enough troops for us to engage in an open battle, or we can break into the castle, sacrificing some troops, but allowing us to mount the defense personally. There is no need to make a decision yet, as they are still preparing siege engines. Their army grows to over 1,200 now, and they are raiding villages near Amatatis and sieging Sedastime once more. The fun never stops. They're hesitant to start the siege, which makes me think the AI won't assault for now, giving us valuable time to race north to defend other fiefs. We reach level 150 leadership, which means we have another choice to make. Citizen militia would give more morale gain after each battle, and veterans' respect would allow us to convert bandits into regular troops. You'll notice our current morale is sitting at 100, which is the maximum, so we pick veterans' respect. We also hit level 28, so we put another point into athletics, capping that skill out. For the attribute point, we put it into vigor so we can reach higher levels of two-handed, although in hindsight it might have been better to put it into cunning so we can get better scouting. Sess the Dame is being sieged by only 460 troops, which we can easily win in an open battle. However, we have several sieges going on now and we must be extremely careful with each troop we have. After waiting a few more days, we decide it's best to defeat them quickly so we can move back south to help Poros. The enemy starts pouring out of the woods, charging straight for us, so we set up the shield wall in front and archers behind and on the hill. We will have the height advantage for this battle. We send both cavalry groups on our right flank. Forward! Move! Out and archer! Forward! They seem content to trade arrows with us, so we oblige and shoot a few of our own into their archers. They seem to have had enough and pushed their shield wall forward. We could maneuver around with our archers, but at this point they are too close and it's best to just meet them head on, as we have the advantage in both quantity and quality. Time to dismount and get our hands dirty. We immediately take a big hit from an enemy Menablion, forcing us to retreat. The casualty feed turns green across the board, so we simply need to survive and we will easily clean them up. Again, their initial advance is crushed, so we pull the troops back to avoid overextension. They hit us with a great cavalry charge from the left, but mostly just right through our lines with minimal casualties. Score formation would have been more effective in catching their cavalry here, I think.
We get a nasty hit on a passing cavalry, then his buddy falls from behind with a sweet revenge hit and we go down. The battle is mostly over at this point though. We lose 51 in total and wipe out another army of nearly 500 in the process. Staying around the 10 to 1 ratio should be the goal every time in larger battles when possible. Our surgeon hits 125 and we get to pick between siege medic and veterinarian. I don't find veterinarian all that useful as we can buy all the steeds in Calradia without an issue for replacement, but losing less troops during a siege can be nice. I do remember the second perk not working properly according to bannerlordperks.com. We race back south to help once more at Poros, but the attackers leave before we get there. Now the whack-a-mole begins. Back up to Sedastheim Castle and defending once more. The enemy forms a circle shield wall and allows us to pummel them with arrows. Our archers don't seem to be having much effect, so we adjust their position. Now they have some elevation on the enemy and the kill feed starts to go green again. They break their formation and start to push forward. I don't really like this position as we will mostly trade with their infantry and falling back some will allow our archers to get a better angle. However, I was getting a little impatient and decided to move our shield wall up and let them duke it out. Fortunately, our archers still have a good angle on the enemy from here. Their infantry disintegrates and we pull our infantry back to the original line. There are still lots of reinforcements coming out from the enemy and we don't want to lose too many troops here. We get picked off by some snipers from the trees, but once more the battle is mostly won at this point. We suffer just over 100 losses to the enemy's 450, so it's not a great battle to be honest, and we could have done better. After resting in the castle for a few days to recover, we get notice of another siege. Poros once more, but this time the army is only a fraction of the previous size. They do initiate the assault this time, so we carefully watch the defenders' numbers to determine when to best intervene. By waiting a little bit, we no longer have to face an army in the 700s, but less than half that number. We even have reinforcements from Pharaon's clan to aid us. The enemy decides to not take the defensive hill they spawn near, so we flank to take it from them. For some reason, they run straight at us, allowing us to pick them off from the heights. They have a significant number of cavalry, so we form a shield square to counter. We use our own cavalry to flank the enemy archers from behind, which limits the damage our infantry square will take. Now all that's left is to deal with the enemy cavalry. The infantry square is working his magic as usual and the enemy cavalry are dwindling quickly. Ride, 
once more, enemy reinforcements are coming, so we pull back the cavalry and allow our archers to continue their work. They lose enough troops to flee the battle, so we give chase. Because of our superior positioning and avoiding a direct engagement with our infantry, we only lose 15 troops. We wiped out an army of over 300, more than 20 to 1 ratio this time. We head back to Lycaron to get an update on the town's progress. Loyalty is staying at 100, and we are gaining more than 4 prosperity per day, which is a huge amount. It won't be long before this town catches up to some of the best in Calradia. We finally reach Charm 275 and take the final perk. We already have 1500 influence in the bank and all the good policies already, but it's nice to have more than we need in case our nobles decide to vote against our policies at some point. At 275, we are gaining plus 5 influence per day from the perk. Once again, the enemy commits the unforgivable sin and raids Farron's village. Fighting large battles in a village setting can be tricky for deploying archers. There are often lots of choke points and make it great for infantry tactics, but a nightmare for archer and cavalry. We also spawn significantly closer to the enemy, giving us precious little time to organize our troops. Archer! There isn't a good place to deploy our archers here. We push our infantry up to their line before they trap us in a choke point. Fortunately, our archers are still able to get in the fight here, but they are taking far heavier casualties than I would like to see given the balance of power from the start. By the end of the battle, we sustain 81 lost souls, but remove another 400 troops from the battlefield. I think pulling back up the hill at the start would have been a better move, but in the moment, without a lot of time to make a decision, moving forward quickly seemed like the best option. We waste no time in picking our next target, Annika Castle. We tried this one before, but were driven away by a large army. This time, we opt to battle a ram and try for a quick siege. They have lots of onagers to contend with, but at worst, we will have injured troops since rocks and boulders can only do injury. The steep hill approaching the castle should help us some, making it more difficult to hit our ram and take it out. We spent some time picking off archers from the walls.
Once we run out of arrows, we scavenge for a few more shots before going in ourselves. Once again, the main gate is wide open, but our troops don't want to go through it. In previous patches, this was rare, but in the current patch, it seems to happen every time. We run in to aggro the defenders in hopes that they will sally out for a fight. The plan works like a charm and our ladder troops are now fighting them on an even playing field. Now our troops like the idea of going through the main gate and we quickly clean up the rest of the defenders. We get caught with our pants down in the main gate, but our troops pick up the slack and finish the assault. We end up losing 106 troops, which is an acceptable number given the circumstances. The battle for the keep is also won, and we only lose one in the process, and Onika Castle is ours. The prosperity is almost a thousand, which is pretty good for a castle. Food levels are good, even without a garden, and most buildings are upgraded here. There isn't much to do, aside from upgrading the food production for more prosperity gain. We drain the castle of its garrison in order to replenish our losses. Now we have a very important decision to make. Do we take the castle for ourselves or let Farron have it? The castle is already in great shape, so I don't mind handing it off right away. By giving it to Pharaon, we also open up another avenue for our own clan, the town of Poros. Pharaon only has 78 influence at the moment, which means we can easily defeat him in any vote. We quickly go to the policy and pick up Precarial Land Tenure. If you've watched my guide on leadership and charm, you may know what's coming next, and it's one of my favorite things to do in all of Bannerlord. Now we can call a vote for fief ownership of any clan within our kingdom at 50% of the influence cost. We want to control as many towns as possible since we will manage them better than the AI will. Next, we call a vote to redistribute the town of Poros to somebody else within the kingdom. Since we're the only other clan, we are the default vote. We now own all towns in the kingdom and can continue to give away castles that we own to replace towns from nobles that we want to recruit. While waiting at Onika Castle for loyalty to top out, we see this group of hostiles approach and... 